as well as uh, several meetings that were held uh, on the ongoing conflict on Syria, and I'll have a little bit more on that in just a bit. And finally, uh, on combating violent extremism, which was the focus of our engagements with the G7, as well as uh, the Global Counterterrorism Forum. Uh, we also saw ongoing progress on combating uh, climate change, uh, both toward reaching the uh, threshold for the Paris Agreement uh, to enter into force this year, and toward an ambitious HFC uh, amendment to the Montreal Protocol ahead of the meeting in Kigali, uh, which will be next month, almost in October. In October. Um, you may have also seen earlier this week, uh, Secretary Kerry was in Colombia, uh, where he led the United States delegation at the signing of the final peace accord uh, between the government of Colombia and the Revolutionary Armed Forces of Colombia, otherwise known as the FARC which ended over 50 years of conflict. Uh, this was the hemisphere's longest war. Uh, the United States has supported this process with the, P with the Peace Columbia Initiative, uh, consisting of three pillars. First, security, uh, including counter-narcotics and the reintegration of former fighters. Uh, second, expanding state presence uh, in public institutions. And then thirdly, justice and uh, other assistance uh, for the victims of this long and difficult conflict. Uh, we would congratulate the people of Colombia on reaching this historic agreement. And then also just uh, wanted to call your attention to uh, the fact that Secretary Kerry gave uh, what I would say was a very impassioned uh, speech earlier today on the Trans-Pacific Partnership uh, and its critical importance to U.S. national security and economic growth, and that was at the Woodrow Wilson Center. Uh, I recommend that all of you would give it a read, uh, especially uh, those among our, our Asian press who are among us today. Um, as it lays out, I think, in very clear and very forceful terms what's at stake uh, if we choose not to uh, uh, pass this landmark trade deal and what it means for U.S. leadership in uh, the Asia-Pacific region uh, if we do so. Um, I think it broke down what uh, is in some ways a very complex economic or trade agreement in very real uh, and uh, uh, um, uh, simple terms about what it means uh, with regard to U.S. leadership in the uh, Asia-Pacific region. Finally, on Syria. Uh, I mentioned, obviously, the numerous meetings uh, held on Syria last week at the U.N. General Assembly, and I know that many of you are following developments uh, there very closely. Uh, both last week and obviously these past several days. And as you know, at this point, uh, we're facing uh, what can only be considered very serious challenges to implementation of the agreement that we reached with Russia in Geneva uh, in, on September 9th. Uh, September 9th. Uh, as you know, very quickly, that involved uh, seven days of uh, decreased, significantly decreased violence, uh, followed by a uh, 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 a cessation of hostilities uh, nationwide, along with uh, access for humanitarian assistance to reach uh, many or uh, significant parts of the country where it has had difficulty reaching up till now. Then finally, uh, the prospect, if we got there, of grounding uh, the regime's air forces in the designated area and then moving forward with a joint implementation center with Russia to target Nusra and Daesh. But you may have seen that Secretary Kerry spoke uh, this morning with Foreign Minister Lavrov, and uh, he emphasized our grave concern about the deteriorating situation in Syria, and he informed the Foreign Minister that the U.S. is making preparations uh, to suspend U.S. bilateral engagement on Syria uh, unless Russia takes immediate steps to end the assault on Aleppo and to restore uh, the cessation of hostilities there. So I'll stop there and open it up to your questions. Please start with you. You had your hand up first. Irina Gilovska, Macedonian TV. Um, obviously, the families of the victims of 9-11 will start to sue uh, Saudi Arabia. How this will affect the U.S. Uh, foreign policy? And will this have any impact on the operations against Daesh in the Middle East? Well, you're talking, I think, about uh, um, the uh, congressional override uh, that took place earlier today. Uh, 
of uh, President Obama's veto of the uh, JASTA legislation. A uh, couple points to make on that. First of all, um, obviously we remain profoundly sympathetic to the uh, families uh, of the 9-11 victims and their desire to pursue justice uh, for their loved ones. Uh, that said, uh, we've been very clear all along that we believe this legislation uh, could have very serious, broad-ranging negative consequences for uh, global U.S. interest. Um, specifically, we've said this uh, legislation uh, will enact broad changes in the way we adhere to longstanding international law regarding sovereign immunity, uh, which could affect our nation's ability, the United States' ability, to act internationally and could affect our relationship with every other uh, country in the world, and that includes Saudi Arabia. Um, so, to put it mildly, and I'm uh, summarizing what I think uh, Josh Ernest of the White House already said, it's, uh, it's, a, it's uh, in many ways, it's a disappointment to, to see this uh, legislation was passed. Please, sir. Yeah, please. Thank you very much. My name is Dong Huiyu with China Review News Agency of Hong mm -hmm. Kong. Sure. Regarding U.S. sanctions on Chinese company and nationals, uh, the spokesperson of Chinese Foreign Ministry said China would cooperate with relative country on the base of mutual respect and equal treatment, but opposed to uh, taking this matter into its own hands by the U.S. based on its domestic laws. How do you communicate with your Chinese counterparts in the past several days? And secondly, uh, Donald Trump wants China to solve the North Korea problem by itself. How would you respond to it? Thank you. Um, your, your first question, though, specifically, just to, to drill down on it, you were asking me, I know you're talking about, I guess, two days ago, there were these uh, um, uh, sanctions announced by the U.S. Department of Treasury, uh, adding four Chinese nationals and one Chinese entity to their specially designated nationals list. Uh, for evading U.S. and U.N. Uh, sanctions that were imposed on North Korea. That's the case you're referencing. But what was your specific question? I apologize. How we're, how we're working with, uh, with China on that? I apologize. How do you uh, communicate with your Chinese counterparts in the past several days? Well, I mean, I, I just say we regularly consult with China uh, with regard to uh, sanctions and North Korea, um, uh, well, frankly, on a wide range of issues, we regularly <laughs> consult with China. Um, but that includes certainly activities of concern. Uh, you know, China is uh, obviously uh, a partner. Uh, it's also concerned about uh, the provocative uh, moves that North Korea has made in recent months, uh, continuing to test missiles and continuing to test, uh, uh, conduct nuclear tests. Uh, that have, frankly, alarmed uh, the entire international community, but certainly those who are, China, who are North Korea's neighbors and certainly uh, the, uh, along the Korean Peninsula, but frankly are a threat to the region's stability and to the United States, or um, uh, security rather, and to the United States security. Um, as you know, we did succeed in passing some of the most stringent sanctions uh, through UN Security Council Resolution 2270 um, that we believe, if enforced, can really uh, bring about, uh, or how, how do I, how I put it is that it can really put pressure on the North Korean government um, to uh, come back to the table to answer questions and try to resolve questions around its nuclear program. But as we always say about sanctions, uh, you know, the proof's in the pudding. They're only as strong as they are through implementation. And so what we've been working with China effectively, where we hope to be effective uh, doing so, is on how do we make these, uh, make sure these sanctions are implemented to the fullest extent. And certainly we've talked about this before, and everyone knows that China has a certain amount of leverage over North Korea. They are its largest trading partner. Uh, so it's vital that uh, we work closely with China in trying to make sure these sanctions have a bite. But certainly with regard to North Korea and with regard to this uh, particular uh, uh, naming of sanctions against Chinese entities and Chinese individuals, uh, we worked uh, in cooperation with uh, the Chinese government in doing so. I'd refer you to the Department of Treasury, certainly, to talk in more greater detail about how that 
uh, how that engagement took place or how that cooperation took place. But uh, um, and your second question was about Donald Trump and and uh, China. You said uh, asking China to play. Well, look. Uh, first of all, I'm going to separate out the question because I don't want to speak to uh, the uh, election. Uh, uh, despite uh, your your questions uh, to the contrary, uh, because it's not my role. But I think what we're trying to do uh, with regard to uh, North Korea is work uh, constructively with our partners and allies in the region. That includes, obviously, Korea, South Korea. It includes Japan. Uh, but obviously, it also includes, as I just said, uh, China. Uh, China has, we believe, um, uh, a certain amount of leverage over North Korea. Uh, and we'd like to see it, or influence, let me put it that way. And we'd like to see it use that influence uh, as much as possible to convince North Korea uh, to uh, scale back on its uh, provocative actions and to uh, engage with the international community to answer the, the very serious concerns the international community has about its nuclear program. So we're continuing those conversations. Um, you know, we think we're of like mind uh, with uh, China and with their other partners in the region. Any question in New York? Yeah, let's go to New York, please. Hi there, thanks, thanks for the briefing. briefing. James Reinald with Middle, Middle East Eye. Um, on Syria, sure. um, this latest uh, Russian-backed assault by Assad's forces on Aleppo, it could be a turning point in the war. This is the um, last major rebel-held stronghold um, in an urban area. You said that your response to the breakdown of the ceasefire is that America might suspend U.S. bilateral negotiations, which I think you must agree isn't a particularly strong line to be taking. Um, it doesn't send a strong signal to Moscow or Damascus. I'm asking, um, have you guys basically given up being a serious player in Syria? And is that situation not going to change now until January 2017? Uh, not at all, and I wouldn't characterize this in any way, shape, or form as a giving up uh, with regard to our engagement on the Syria crisis. In fact, just yesterday we announced an additional um, uh, $365 million that we're actually uh, putting forward. We are the largest uh, provider of humanitarian assistance uh, to uh, Syria and the crisis there, uh, but we uh, obviously uh, just announced an additional 300 and some 365 or $70 million in addition to that. But to speak specifically to your question about um, uh, the, I think you're referring to the, uh, the, the fact that I mentioned in my uh, uh, opening remarks, um, I, I would not say this is a giving up or a walking away uh, from our uh, very serious concern and very serious engagement about Syria. Um, but I think we're also, and the Secretary Kerry has spoken to this, um, we're also at a point where uh, we have to seriously question uh, Russia's uh, own uh, intentions uh, with regard to implementing what was agreed to in Geneva. Uh, over the last several days, uh, the assault, uh, the airstrikes, uh, by the way, on civilian targets, including hospitals and, and civilian areas, uh, have been outrageous. And uh, I think it's incumbent on us uh, to say as much. And so uh, we've made that clear to uh, the Russian government uh, that unless we see uh, in the very near future uh, some effort uh, to put back in place uh, a cessation of hostilities that's sustainable, and what Secretary Kerry hit on last week unless we see measures taken to restore some credibility to this diplomatic process, and he spoke about some of those ideas uh, last week in New York, then it really gets to the point where it's futile uh, to continue in this effort. Um, that said, uh, Secretary Kerry was also very clear in his role as this country's lead diplomat that it would be diplomatic malpractice, I think is the term he used, for him not to pursue, to the very last uh, degree possible, a diplomatic solution, uh, a political solution to what's happening in Syria. And I will say that as contentious as the ISSG, the International Syria Support Group meeting, was last week in New York, and it was contentious, everyone in that room agreed that 
the best possible way forward, and frankly, the only way forward was this Geneva Agreement. Um, but time and time again, we've seen it break down along familiar lines. And, you know, as my colleague John Kirby just said in the State Department briefing, uh, you know, we're not saying that uh, this, the moderate opposition is not without blame here. But by and large, the preponderance of uh, violations of the cessation of hostilities was on the part of the regime with Russia's backing. So I think we're at a, uh, a point where we need to question seriously whether we can continue, to continue this process. And we're at a point, too, where we need to look at what, Dan, as you asked with your question, what possible next steps we take. Uh, I don't think we're there yet. We're not, we haven't reached a decision on what those possible next steps may be, but uh, I, I also think we can't delude ourselves in continuing uh, a process that bears no fruit. Uh, you, please. I'll get to the back, I promise. I'm calling up front. This is Lena Aguirre, Greek Public TV. Yes. So Greece is planning to transfer a large number of refugees from the Pact Islands to the mainland because, uh, as a Greek officials say, some European countries uh, do not even respond to the request for help. So my question is, how are you planning to help Greece and the refugees now that the winter is coming uh, once again sure. and now that the situation in Syria is getting worse? Thank you. Well, I, I, again, I, I, and I'd have to check on specifically what we may be doing to help Greece. Uh, I, I know this is a huge issue. Obviously, we talked about it was a major issue. The worldwide, the global refugee crisis was a major issue and topic of conversation, uh, and certainly a, a, um, uh, one of President Obama's uh, priorities at the UN General Assembly last week. Um, but certainly, uh, uh, one of the biggest pieces of this, one of the biggest challenges is obviously, as Europe well knows, uh, the uh, refugees fleeing uh, the conflict in Syria. And frankly, it all ties back together. So a couple of things I would say. One is um, really the, the main way to resolve this is to reach some kind of end to the conflict in Syria. Um, we have a plan put forward to do that. Unfortunately, uh, it is, uh, to put it mildly, stalled right now. <coughs> Um, but we're trying to get this in track, or in place rather, trying to get it back up and running because we know that if we can get a political pro uh, negotiation in place that can lead to a peaceful political transition, then we can do what, uh, what all these refugees desire, which we can return them home. Um, but I think you're talking about a larger challenge for uh, the, the, many of the countries in Europe and certainly Greece, which has uh, uh, face this challenge of the influx of refugees. Um, I know that Europe is looking at uh, different solutions. And I know that many of the regions in the country, not just Greece, or the region rather, but Jordan, uh, many of the countries that border on Syria have been dealing with uh, an influx of refugees um, and doing, uh, frankly, uh, stellar uh, work to accommodate uh, these people um, who, as we all know, are victims of the conflict, uh, many of them. Uh, and uh, we've done our own uh, effort by increasing the uh, number of uh, Syrian refugees that uh, we brought into the United States this year. Uh, in some ways, you could argue it's a drop in the bucket considering the number, but uh, we did significantly increase the number of refugees that uh, have Syrian refugees that have uh, been brought into the United States. But I think we're all looking at this, and it was really the intent of President Obama's message, one of his main core messages last week is the world needs to look at the refugee crisis writ large and certainly focused on the uh, humanitarian situation uh, in Syria and do more to help uh, and come up with new approaches on how to uh, deal with the uh, influx of refugees. And certainly, as I said, Greece and Europe are feeling that. Please, sir. Mohammed al Minshir from Al Arabi Television. Back to just a bill. Now the Congress overrides a President veto. What's plan B for the administration? Do you have measures or set, uh, steps to, to minimize the damage uh, and the Saudi uh, concerns? And uh, are you afraid that Saudi will be concerned of, or hesitant to cooperate in countering uh, violence extremism? Well, um, I mean, I think, you know, we are concerned that it, um, that this uh, legislation, this law uh, threatens to complicate uh, our relationships with uh, some of our closest partners. Um, uh, you know, I would say with regarding our relationship with uh, Saudi Arabia, it's, it's a very strong and solid relationship. 
uh, one that stood the test of time and one that is based on a wide range of uh, mutual interests. Uh, and Secretary Kerry obviously will speak to uh, our ongoing cooperation on a number of issues, including Syria, including Yemen, uh, with uh, Saudi Arabia. Um, and we're going to continue to work with the uh, government of Saudi Arabia on all of these issues, on the full range of issues that we uh, cooperate on. Um, this is something we've been discussing with these governments. Uh, I'm not going to detail uh, our diplomatic uh, conversations, um, but uh, certainly there have been concerns uh, voiced about uh, the impact of this legislation. I think we're still in early days. We're still assessing uh, what this will mean. Uh, but we made our, very, our concerns, as I just did, uh, very public about uh, the impact of this legislation on the United States' ability um, to engage in many of the uh, – that doesn't – you know, that's, that's something we're going to have to deal with and look at and examine as we move forward. Um, and certainly we're looking at the impact, as you note, of this – what this legislation may have on some of our important uh, relations including Saudi Arabia in the region, but too soon to say what next steps may be. Please, sir, you. Thank you, Jafar Jafari with Al-Mayadeen TV. Uh, on Syria, sure. uh, it is often referred to as a civil war, uh, and normally that is attributed to anonymous U.S. officials, that term. Now, with, with the um, – Germans recently came out and said that there are tens of thousands, I don't recall the exact number, I, I don't want to make a mistake, okay. tens of thousands of those uh, fighters or uh, opposition groups uh, have mu are of multiple nationalities, so that, that hardly um, qualifies for a civil war definition. Now, is it still accurate to call it a civil war? when we have so many uh, foreign fighters of different nationalities. I, I, I think I see and your point. Second, yeah, you're, yeah. Uh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, sorry. And the second okay. uh, 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 question, the, before the, cease, uh, the hostilities, uh, the cessation of hostilities collapsed, the Russian side had always said, you know, the United States was supposed to have given us delineation of Nusra's uh, positions, uh, and other details. Yep. Why hasn't the U.S. done that? Sure. So starting with the first part of your question, which is, is this a civil war? Does this constitute a civil war? I think if you look back at the origins, first of all, it is a very complex battle space uh, in Syria right now, because not only do you have, as, you, as we'll discuss soon, the civil war there, the, the war being carried out between the regime and the, and the moderate uh, opposition, but you've also got groups like Nusra, uh, an al-Qaeda affiliate, and then, of course, uh, Daesh or ISIL, uh, which is also um, because of uh, the uh, ungoverned areas, frankly, that were created by the civil conflict uh, have uh, put roots down. So there's war within war, if you will, there, because uh, certainly we, as part of the, uh, the anti ISIL or anti-Daesh coalition are working with uh, many of the local groups in northern Syria as well as with Turkey and other members of the coalition to drive out to uproot uh, Daesh uh, from where from the territory it holds uh, in Syria uh, and have had considerable success doing so. But what I think you're focused on uh, in your question is does this constitute a civil war when you have outside actors like Russia, like Iran? with troops on the ground, with uh, uh, forces uh, active in that area, does it still constitute a civil war? Look, I think if you look at, at its root, uh, where this conflict or how this conflict came about, uh, President Assad, uh, in response to what were uh, largely peaceful civilian uh, protests, and I'm going back now six years, uh, responded with a very heavy hand and went after these groups of protesters, uh, beat them, killed some of them, arrested many of them, and frankly uh, generated uh, much of the conflict that ensued. 
Um, and he has continued to stoke this by carrying out attacks against moderate opposition, uh, against civilian populations, and really, as I said, driving some of these groups into the arms of extremists. Uh, we've talked about that dynamic as well. So it's a very complex uh, situation. Nobody's going to deny that. And just as we said all along, all of this is based, and by all of this I mean the Geneva Agreement, is based on the supposition that we can, we, the United States, and some of our other partners within the ISSG can exert the influence necessary or needed for the moderate opposition uh, to adhere to a cessation of hostilities, and it's incumbent on Russia to also uh, uh, influence the regime to also adhere uh, to that uh, same cessation of hostilities. If you don't have that, you don't have a cessation of hostilities. Uh, I, I think what, uh, what you've seen by and large in the early initial days uh, after the Eid, uh, when this latest effort came into, uh, came into effect, you did see a relative short but a relative period of calming uh, for the first several days, but there were still violations. Um, to get to your question, though, about this delineation, uh, it's absolutely correct to say that we and, the, and Russia were talking about how to, how do you disconnect or, or um, uh, where there's overlap, and there is indeed overlap, uh, partly created by the pressure that the regime's placed on some of these moderate opposition groups. Uh, between Nusra and some of these opposition groups. I think that was the idea behind the cessation of hostilities was a seven-day period of calm after which, um, if you got it, the regime would ground the terror forces and we would go after, in coordination with Russia, Nusra. Now, if you were a member of the opposition and you had not adhered to or not disengaged with Nusra by that period of time, then you were considered part of Nusra, and you would be a viable target. Now, if you had not and adhered to this and had adhered to the cessation of hostilities and disengaged from Nusra, then you were part of the cessation of hostilities. So, in many ways, it was a self-identifying uh, process, uh, but a very important one, because you need to obviously disentangle what has become a fact of a reality in and around parts of Aleppo, and then. And it's really the missed opportunity here. What we wanted to get to with Russia was a really strategic assault on Nusra, much, of, much in the same way that we've gone after senior leaders and targeted ISIL uh, in Iraq, but also in Syria, where we're really going after key leadership and not just uh, going after uh, targets that may involve civilian targets that may uh, uh, also result in civilian casualties. So a more strategic and a more precise uh, targeting of Nusra. But we're not there. We're nowhere, uh, we're nowhere close to that, uh, uh, to that point now. In the back. Yes, sir. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, get the New York. Yeah, hey, New York. Sorry. Assistant yes, Secretary uh, Daniel Russell told the U.S. had uh, requested to many, many countries degradation of a diplomatic uh, relationship with North Korea. Is that right? Uh, could you explain more, more about it? I'm sorry, you're, uh, you, you just said that uh, Assistant Secretary Danny Russell's, uh, I just want to make sure I heard yeah, the question yeah, clearly. He told that the, the, the U.S. had requested the degradation of a diplomatic relationship with North Korea. Had requested the degradation of diplomatic relations with North Korea. Yeah, is that right? I'm not aware of those remarks. Uh, I'm not sure where he made them. Did he, is this? Can you give me a little bit more context? Yeah, yeah. Asia Pacific. A, yeah, Asia Pacific here yesterday. Yeah, yeah. Um, look, I mean, uh, certainly, uh, uh, Secretary Russell's uh, 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 words speak for themselves. I'm not going to um, uh, attempt to parse them. Uh, I think uh, what, and I haven't. I apologize. I haven't seen the exact transcript. But what I think he may be referring to is the fact that. And certainly the uh, Korean foreign minister raised this last week is in response to uh, North Korea's ongoing uh, uh, efforts to spurn the international community's very real, very valid concerns about its nuclear program that 
it's worth looking at uh, how we engage with uh, North Korea diplomatically, how the international community engages with North Korea uh, diplomatically. I think, look, I think that, uh, you know, there's obviously real concern in the region and around the world about uh, uh, North Korea's uh, bad behavior. And how do we get them back to a point where they're willing to, uh, again, engage constructively uh, in a process and, and the, in talks uh, about its nuclear program? Um, instead, we just simply see provocative action after provocative action. So I think we're, we're working uh, very closely with a number of countries in the region about possible steps and initiatives we can take uh, in response to that challenge. Um, but uh, we continue to, to, to try to work at that. It's not easy. Uh, I'm going to start waiting to back you in the yellow. Thank you. Yeah. New York. Oh, I'm so sorry. Can I do New York first, and then I promise I'll get to you. Oh, I'll, I'll do New York said New York. I, I did. She's right. She's keeping me honest. Fighting for our rights from New York. Yes, of course. Uh, thank you, Mr. Tan. Thank you for this briefing. This is Errol Ardovich with Daily Abbas from Sarajevo, Daily from Bosnia and Herzegovina. Uh, thank you also for addressing the very important issue for us of the illegal referendum if a small Bosnia entity RS. A couple of points, or actually rather questions. Uh, when you said that you are condemning this obviously unconstitutional referendum, does that mean that you encourage uh, more tough action uh, of the domestic judiciary, BH domestic judiciary, especially in the today's light of suspension of chief prosecutor of Bosnia and Herzegovina? And separately, will the U.S. push or undertake any sanctions against uh, RS or, uh, for example, uh, freeze assets or uh, those of those responsible or put travel ban or blacklist Mr. Miller, Dalik and uh, those surrounding him on this. What can you tell actually in regard to those who are very concerned that uh, somehow Bosnia is neglected on account of their uh, neighbors like Serbia uh, which uh, keep all the lights from uh, European Union and the U.S. Thank you. Sure. Um, well, I certainly don't want to, um, in response to your uh, very detailed question, but you did mention uh, the threat of sanctions or possible sanctions. Uh, look, we're not there yet, um, obviously. Uh, that's not something we're considering at this point in time. Um, I, I think that, you know, uh, and I know you're talking about the, the this uh, September 25th referendum is what you're referring to. Is that correct? Yeah. Uh, um, so a couple points to make. One is um, we think that the referendum proceeded in a manner that uh, was in direct contravention of uh, the constitutional court order to suspend uh, the referendum. And frankly, the Constitutional Court, as we said, is an integral part of the Dayton Peace Agreement, and its findings should be binding and respected. Um, and so respect for rule of law uh, by all parties in Bosnia and Herzegovina is critical uh, to uh, the democratic process there. And if you lose that functioning legal framework, uh, and frankly the stability that it brings, then it is impossible to address many of the other political and economic challenges that the country faces. Uh, of course, holidays and uh, celebrations are important to any culture and any uh, society. Um, but rather than proceeding with uh, constitutional referendums or an unconstitutional referendum, uh, leaders should be working uh, to resolve differences in the interests of all the citizens there. So. We believe the referendum was a waste. Uh, it was a waste of valuable resources um, and won't resa result in any real progress uh, for the many challenges that uh, Bosnia uh, and Herzegovina uh, face. Um, I, I don't want to speak to possible next steps uh, we'll take. Uh, as I said, we're not at the point of considering any kind of uh, uh, at taking any kind of actions and with regard to sanctions or any kind of or punishment of this behavior, but, uh, you know, it's a matter of concern, and frankly, it's, uh, 
it's a uh, it, it continues to hamper, as we said, uh, or as I just said, uh, what we believe uh, is the kind of real political progress needed on the many uh, economic and political challenges that uh, Bosnia faces. Please, oh, you in the back, I know, I promise, and then to you. Thank you very much, Mark. Uh, my name is Zhang Xin from the China Central Television sure. on a different topic. So this year, the U.S. president actually met with the Chinese president twice, both here at the uh, nuclear summit and also in China in Hangzhou at the G20. And he also met with the Chinese premier a week ago in the United Nations General Assembly. So. You know, the leaders spend quite some time together. What does this imply? And also, in the coming year, what are the priorities uh, between U.S. and China on bilateral relations? When the new president vows in, do you think the foreign policy could be a big change from what it is now? And do you have a buffer zone in the State Department to, you know, to uh, cope with the changes? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, sure. Um, well, look, um, it goes without saying that uh, our relations uh, relationship, our bilateral relationship with China is, uh, uh, to put it mildly, very significant, uh, very important. Uh, and certainly that's reflected in, as you said, the president's, two presidents engagement uh, over the past of the, the past uh, couple years. Um, and of course it's a relationship that spans many issues uh, and has uh, some areas of real cooperation, such as on climate, uh, and that's been a significant area of cooperation, and some challenges as well, such as uh, our concerns, ongoing concerns about human rights. Um, but it is a it is a relationship that's uh, absolutely vital uh, to both our country's interests, um, to the certainly to the national security interests of the United States, uh, to pursue uh, where we can, whenever we can, a constructive and positive relationship with China. But also, I think it's important just the fact that we are able to sit down our leaders both at the foreign minister level, but certainly at the presidential level, and talk things through and talk about some of these issues where we have disagreements, to talk through those disagreements, but where we see where areas where we can cooperate to try to leverage those areas and to work together uh, productively. And we've seen that in multilateral settings, certainly with respect to uh, the Iran nuclear agreement. So as much as we can maximize uh, those areas of cooperation, and work through uh, continuing uh, challenges that we have in relationship, we're certainly going to pursue that to our utmost, regardless of who becomes president. Um, it's a very complicated relationship because we are, uh, you know, one's a rising power, one's a, a, a considerable power, a global power. But, uh, you know, we believe it's uh, absolutely critical to, uh, uh, to strengthen that relationship. Oh, um, well, again, I think I spoke to the priorities. I, uh, you know, I mean, I can go through a laundry list, but I think, you know, we're going to continue to work with uh, China on global issues of concern. That includes North Korea. Uh, that includes uh, uh, continuing to hold Iran's feet to the fire uh, with regards to the JCPOA. It also includes uh, uh, working together productively on climate change. Uh, and that's been an area, as I said, of real constructive uh, engagement and cooperation. Um, you know, uh, we're going to work, obviously, to, on closer economic ties um, and also work on the challenges, as we've talked about, some of the cybersecurity challenges, some of the human rights challenges. We're not going to shy away from those issues. So those are all the baskets of issues that we look at. And certainly with regard to uh, some of the other uh, difficult issues like South China Sea, um, we want to see um, more dialogue, more constructive engagement. We're not a claimant there. We're not, we don't have a dog in that fight, as we say in America. Uh, but what we want to see is with those who do uh, have concerns and claims about the South China Sea uh, to work uh, to establish mechanisms whereby they can resolve those differences uh, diplomatically. I'm going to go. I'm going to move on, please. Oh, that's okay. We'll get there. I'll wait. Diana Castanera, NTN24, Colombia. Sure. Um, Colombian people is going to vote on FARC peace deal this Sunday, and I want to know what are the this vote, especially if, it, if the result is no to this um, deal, and also if you can comment about the meeting that the Secretary Kerry had with the President of Venezuela in Colombia, uh, especially after uh, Venezuelan officials uh, deny 
uh, recall vote in 2016. Okay. Uh, try to work through those. So first of all, you're talking about the plebiscite, the plebiscite. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that correctly. <laughs> um, look, we uh, obviously, as I just said at the top, this was a significant uh, moment in the history of Colombia, the longest standing uh, ongoing conflict in uh, the hemisphere to be resolved. Uh, it took a tremendous amount of courage and leadership by the government of Colombia, and certainly we stand in support of that, uh, that agreement. Um, but ultimately, you know, the outcome of any plebiscite uh, on the peace accords is for the Colombian people uh, to decide. Uh, we're also, as you probably can guess, uh, strong believers in the democratic process. Um, so while we are clear about what we believe uh, uh, is the right uh, way forward for Colombia, uh, we certainly leave it to the Colombian people uh, to reach uh, uh, that conclusion on their own uh, through uh, the democratic process. Um, but again, we believe the time has come uh, for peace. Um, and again, this was, a, as I just said, this was an initiative that took a tremendous, a lot of, a tremendous amount of courage and hard work uh, by people on all sides of the conflict. Uh, so we'd like to see it succeed going forward. And you asked about Venezuela. And we, I think we issued a, um, uh, a, uh, a readout of the uh, Secretary's, uh, Secretary Kerry's um, meeting with uh, President Maduro the other day. Um, but he did, as, as you raised in your question, he did meet with President Maduro on the, out, on the margins of the, um, trip, his trip to uh, Cartagena uh, on Monday, September 26th. Uh, he raised our concerns about uh, the ongoing economic uh, and political challenges, certainly political challenges, uh, that have affected millions of Venezuelans. Um, and there are very real concerns about uh, the plight of uh, many Venezuelans who've been uh, seriously affected by uh, food shortages, water shortages, etc. cetera. Um, and he urged uh, President Maduro to uh, work constructively on uh, or with opposition leaders uh, to address some of these challenges. Uh, you know, the Secretary said it best, I think, in summing up the meeting and summing up our uh, what we're looking for is a way to work towards a solution with, uh, that works for the people of Venezuela. Uh, and that's always going to be our, uh, our, um, our priority going forward. Sure. Um, <laughs> right in the back, please. Oh, we have one more, and then we'll take one more from New York. I'm sorry. I'm ignoring New York. I was there too much last week. I'm sorry. I'll get to it. I apologize. I'm not. You and then. Thank you, Mark. This is Heba Kotsi from Shark al Ausat newspaper. I have a question on Syria again. Of course. I understand the U.S. position. Um, to continue the diplomatic efforts and cooperate with, with, Rus with Russia to get a political solution in Syria. But it seems with the intensified Russian-Syrian airstrike on Apollo that it doesn't care, uh, Russia doesn't care or doesn't give a damn about uh, the U.S. cooperation. What leverage do you have on Russia and one, uh, what other options besides the diplomatic efforts, what do you have? Uh, uh, what options do you sure. have on the table? And another question regarding arming the Syrian rebels. Uh, don't you see this is some kind of imitating the same scenario uh, when, when, uh, when other countries uh, armed the Mojahideen in Afghanistan and that led to a success sure. uh, over uh, Russian so influence? Sorry, I don't mean to cut you off. Please, thank you. Thanks for the questions. Um, uh, your, your question about leverage and, uh, is a good one. Um, so, uh, I don't want folks to misinterpret what uh, the Secretary conveyed to Foreign Minister Lavrov earlier today. Um, what he was saying was that it becomes futile to pursue, continue to pursue this agreement that we worked out in Geneva if we continue to see the kind of uh, full frontal assault on parts of Aleppo that we've seen over the past several days, uh, again, uh, that are worse than what we've seen in the previous weeks and months. Um, 
you know, the use of incendiary and bunker busting, uh, bunker buster bombs uh, in an urban environment uh, that uh, target uh, civilian infrastructure, but certainly uh, put at risk civilian lives is unacceptable. And I think we have to, at some point, uh, say that. And we have. all together, but I think what we need at this point is some gestures on the part of uh, Russia, but certainly the regime, uh, that at least restore some kind of credibility to this process. Otherwise, you know, you can fool me once, or what's the expression, <laughs> uh, you know, and then by a certain point you have to say, no more, we're not going to pursue this. So I think we're at a point now where we're looking at uh, uh, the situation and we need to see extraordinary measures taken to restore some kind of credibility to this process. We may get there. Uh, I don't want to close that door, uh, certainly not before uh, 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 Russia's had a chance to respond, um, but that's where we're at. Uh, so in terms of leverage, uh, look, I mean, that's the, the whole idea behind this International Syria Support Group is based on uh, the fact that everyone around that, in that, around that table or in that room is a quote-unquote stakeholder on what happens in Syria. And everyone who's a member of that group has said that they want to see a peaceful resolution to the conflict in Syria. So based on that, based on that core tenet, that's what we've been working to, to achieve. Uh, Russia has also said that they want to see that kind of transition, that peaceful political transition. I think the leverage is, if there is any leverage, it's that that could all be thrown out the window and placed in jeopardy. And as I said to our own press corps the last couple of days, the situation in Syria is horrific, but it could get worse. And to answer your second question, um, I don't think any of us want to see a situation where we've got other governments uh, uh, providing arms or increasing uh, assistance and arms to some of the rebel factions that are fighting on the ground. But that's certainly a scenario that you could see happening. And I think um, we're just stating what could well happen if, uh, if uh, this cessation of hostilities fails once more uh, and we're back to uh, a state of all-out conflict. Nobody wants to see that. We still uh, believe that there's uh, space for a diplomatic solution. We haven't given up on that effort yet, uh, and uh, we're going to continue to to seek that di uh, that diplomatic solution to the utmost degree possible. In terms of Canadian hacking, that's, I mean, that is Canadian I, I'm talking about, and again, I'm not certainly. This is not something the U.S. is considering. But what I'm saying is, other governments. I mean, Secretary Kerry said as much. We can't predict what other governments may do if there's a return to all-out conflict. Did I lose my New York person? Sure, absolutely. Andre, go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to follow up. Of course. Thanks, Andrei Sito from TAS from Russia. Thanks uh, to the FPC for hosting the briefing, and thank you for coming over. Good, Good to see you. Sir. Uh, basically, a follow-up to that. Uh, you are saying uh, the door is not yet closed. Uh, I obviously want to ask you how soon <laughs> it, it will uh, close. Uh, you yeah. obviously will not tell me, so uh, just <laughs> tell me uh, if, the, if, if the decision uh, has been taken on when to close it, if it's just a matter of uh, the clock running out and it will happen automatically, or if uh, some additional steps need to be taken uh, for that decision to be, to, to be taken. Thank you, sir. Sure. Um, and uh, my short answer is uh, I don't have a definitive answer for that. Uh, I, can't, I can't put a, a date certain or an hour certain that when that door will close, uh, as we're uh, using that metaphor. Um, but I think that uh, it's very close, uh, and by that I mean that, you know, we've seen a real intensification of the assault on Syria, and uh, as I said, it, it starts to strain um, our credulity if, to believe in a, 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 a genuine uh, diplomatic process in the face of this all-out uh, assault on, uh, on uh, the civilian population of uh, Aleppo. Um, I think, is it last question, or are we? 
Is that all we have time for? I think that's all we have time for, okay. unless you. Okay, no, I'll take one more. All yeah. right, one more. Thank you. Please. Last question. Thank you. I'm Lucia Leal with uh, Spanish Newswire FA. Um, I wanted to ask about Cuba. Yesterday, President Obama nominated an ambassador to Cuba. Um, after more than a year with just a Chargéd affairs there, uh, why did he decide to do this now? And how, hope, how hopeful are you that the Senate will confirm him since uh, Senator Rubio has already expressed opposition to this? Uh, well, excuse me. Uh, so, first of all, uh, why now? Because we believe that American interest in Cuba will be uh, best representative, represented uh, by a Senate-confirmed U.S. ambassador, um, not just in Cuba but everywhere in the world. Uh, we always want to see uh, a confirmed ambassador uh, leading uh, the U.S. mission to any given country. Uh, certainly, we've got very competent, capable chargé d'affaires in many countries around the world uh, where our ambassadors are still being uh, vetted by uh, the Senate. Uh, but it's always our desire to see our missions led, whether it's in Cuba or anywhere in the world, to be led by a U.S. ambassador who is representing the U.S. government there. Um, we think that with respect to Cuba, an ambassador in place and, and the individual uh, is being considered as a, as a real a seasoned diplomat. Uh, but uh, it's going to further strengthen our ability to advance the normalization process uh, and advocate for U.S. interests uh, in the areas of law enforcement, in the areas of human rights, counter-narcotics, environmental protection, uh, and the many other areas where we want to work uh, on more constructively with uh, the government of Cuba. Um, and just to, in response to your second part of your question, why is it important uh, for him to be confirmed by the Senate? Well, we think the voice of an ambassador uh, will also provide a high platform or high profile platform, I guess, in Havana for the administration uh, to continue to promote uh, respect for human rights, uh, both through engagement with uh, the Cuban government but also with, uh, with the human rights community there. Um, and that's something that we certainly believe is in Congress's interest as well and in the interest of the, uh, of the American people. So um, finally, I just would say that, you know, by confirming an ambassador to Cuba, uh, we think the, the Senate would signal uh, support for deepening ties with Cuba and Cuban-American and Cuban communities. Um, and I think, you know, uh, since we've normalized diplomatic ties with Cuba, I think many of the naysayers or the doubters uh, about that uh, action have now seen uh, the very tangible, some of the tangible results in the people-to-people -people ties uh, that while we haven't seen all the political progress uh, that we'd like to see with regard to, uh, as we said, progress on human rights and some other areas, we have seen a real uh, strengthening of people-to-people -people engagement. Uh, that have, uh, frankly, uh, uh, I think, proven really constructive and really uh, effective in uh, in strengthening our diplomatic relations with uh, with Cuba. So I'll end it there. Thanks so much uh, for uh, listening to me <laughs> and asking me questions. Happy to come back. I'll try to make it sooner rather than later. And uh, thanks so much, everybody. reception area to celebrate an end of a fiscal year, the end of summer, end and of to thank year. you for all uh, that you've done with us this year. Thanks. Thanks so much, guys. I'll see you in a second. I'm going to drop this.